Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin, shall we? Let's begin. Hello and welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a terrific turnout. I really appreciate your presence here today. Uh, this is a very special uh, event for us. We have a wonderful guest presenter uh, for you today, Dr. Chendrai Kumanyika. Uh, before we begin, I want to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues in the Department uh, of Communication, Arts, and Sciences who've made this possible, especially Karen Lawler, our department chair, as well as Jim Furrer, who's in the back uh, and is recording and also uh, testing live streaming technology for this particular event. Um, I think the integration of technology, uh, arts and humanities, critical thinking is emblematic of the kind of thing that our department uh, and our communication studies and broadcasting programs offer to students here and uh, I hope you have a wonderful experience. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Chendrai Kumanyika, who's our guest and uh, presenter today, is a very busy man. He ended one uh, of his pieces written for National Public Radio by saying, so let's make moves. And he is definitely a man who is making moves. He's very busy. He is a scholar, an activist, an artist who currently holds a creativity professorship at Clemson University in South Carolina. Uh, he's also, though, a board member for several youth mentoring programs and a news analyst for Uprising Radio. On top of that, his January 2015 article on vocal color in public radio trended nationally uh, on Twitter, was also produced and released on transom.org, uh, was featured on NPR, in the Washington Post, on BuzzFeed, and continued a range of conversations around diversity, public radio, broadcast, uh, and our media landscape today. He's a founding member of the hip-hop group The Spooks, whose first album, S-I-O-S-O-S, -O -S -O -S, Volume 1, uh, from 2000, uh, produced singles that reached gold selling rec uh, levels in four countries and placed highly on top ten charts in a number of countries. Uh, you can learn more about Dr. Kumanyika on his website, which is chenjerai.net. That's spelled C-H-E-N-J-E-R-A-I.net. Uh, I'll allow him to introduce uh, in more detail and depth uh, the topic of his conversation today, but uh, I'm appreciative of your presence here today, and let's welcome Dr. Chenjerai Kumanyika. Um, thank you so much. Wow, everybody's packed in here. I, I, y'all really, came out. I hope the people here can see because we're going to have some things on the screen. Um, I just really want to thank you all for having me out. I want to thank in particular the Department of Communication, Arts, and Sciences. Um, you know, I, I want to thank, I want to give a shout out to Jacqueline Kirby who had to do some of the administrative work to bring me here. She actually is working and can't even be here, but I know she put in that unseen, invisible labor. So shout out to her. Um, thank you to, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, Brendan Kendall, who's really, you know, a mentor to me and a colleague at the same time. I've had a chance while I've, the short time I've been here to meet some of the faculty. I was in uh, Jim Furr's class I met, and I got to um, meet with Sam and Katia. And I'm really inspired by what's going on here. I'm just blown away and I'm going to go back and say really cool things about what's happening here. And the students in Jim Furrow's class that I met, wow, just folks is, y'all are on your grind out here, you know what I mean? I mean, I can, see that, I can see that there's some people out here who are facing, you know, some challenges and, you know, that like some of the people like Clemson ain't facing, I'm going to go back like, look, y'all better get on your grind, man, you know what I mean? People on your heels out in Denver. So I really appreciate that and I'm excited to talk to y'all. I'm going to talk to y'all for about an hour. Uh, but I'm going to try, I know, and I know there's some people here for extra credit, so we're going to try to make this a fun extra credit activity. Um, so I'm going to also read a lot because I want to, um, I have a tendency to ramble, and so I don't want to, I don't want to go on tangents, so I don't want to do that. Um, and I call my piece that we're going to talk about today, The Revolution Real Reality Show, Storytelling and Activism in Contemporary Social Justice Work. <clears throat> The language of revolution is being used all around us. <clears throat> Time Magazine recently featured an article uh, where they're kind of talking about this idea of revolution and how this language is all around us. Now, I don't know what y'all think about when you think of revolutionaries, but uh, <laughs> this is what Time Magazine thinks about, right? And it's true, the language of revolution is in the mouths of conservative politicians who are stoking the fires of right-wing populism to overthrow the GOP establishment, 
And revolution was also in the mouths of social democrat politicians looking to overthrow, you know, uh, this, this, the systems that created the beleaguered middle class and a fully privatized future. But most importantly, the spirit of revolution has caught fire among a generation of young people who are challenging the status quo on a variety of issues, and that's good. But I called my presentation a revolution reality show because I think we should all think critically about this language of revolution. I'm not going to get too theoretical out here. I want to I want to tell stories a little bit. But for the scholars who are there and the theoretically minded, I want to invite you into this problem of this idea of the revolution reality show, which of course has been theorized in social theory many different ways. In a capitalist media environment, everything, even revolution, can be packaged for profit. As a result, we find ourselves staggering from screen to screen, phone to laptop to television to sleep, back to phone, etc. We can easily lose sight of where the show ends and where our reality begins, where entertainment ends and where democracy begins. So I came here today to talk about storytelling and activism. So much going on and politically that I could analyze, but a lot of times speakers give you a brilliant analysis of the situation, but they don't really give you things that you could do. You know, like in the Q&A, somebody goes, so what do we do about it? And they go, well, make up your own solution. You know, it's open to everybody kind of thing. So I, I'm probably going to do something like that, to be honest with you, right, too. But I, you know, but like, I wanted to give you some things that we can do. So although I'm going to be talking about myself, I really want to talk about everything I'm doing is an example of things that I think you all can do and can take to the next level. And that what I've seen is that you all are already doing here. So that's, I'm really inspired by that. Now, um, I'm going to tell you three stories that kind of uh, go into what I mean the problems and sort of promises of the revolution reality show. I was debating whether I'm going to do this, but since I'm a silly person, every reality show needs some type of theme song or int introduction. So when I say, I'm going to pose a question, and I'm going to say, what do we call that? And y'all going to say, the revolution reality show. All right? That's how it's going to go, all right? A couple of times. Just, just to be corny. Why not? Right? Why not be weird? All right, here we go. When you spend your whole life in front of screens, going from screen to screen, what do we call that? The reality show. When reality TV stars become presidential candidates, what do we call that? The reality show. All right. Let's go into it. <clears throat> I became a live streamer kind of by accident. In August 2014, when Michael Brown was shot, the streets of St. Louis, Missouri exploded. I remember watching this footage from a hotel room on live stream in North Carolina as heavily militarized police officers shot tear gas and rubber bullets on young people in that community who were protesting. As I watched, I tried to tell myself I wasn't going to go from South Carolina all the way to Ferguson right before a school semester started. But my wife and I did go. And we marched with people up and down West Florissant. And we spent time on Canfield, the street where Michael Brown was killed. And I met a popular live streamer named John Ziegler. That's Rebel Z right there. This guy taught me to live stream. I got a lot of love for him. <clears throat> Reb Z said he was determined to teach me to stream. Like, I didn't come to stream, right? But he just was like, yo, I'm going to teach you how to live stream. I told him, uh, I was like, yo, man, I don't have time. I'm a professor, right? Like, I, I, you know, this is cool, but I don't have time for that right now. He said, uh, sorry, dog, you don't have a choice. You see, <clears throat> John was white, and there was a lot of live streamers who were in Ferguson, but none of them were people of color. Live streaming creates a tremendous potential to give people a sort of less produced mode of video to involve people in the conversation. But if nobody behind the camera is a person of color or look like the people from that community, it limits the kind of conversations that you can create. I still didn't feel like I had time, but as I thought about that problem more, I said, you know what, I'm out here in Ferguson, why not let John teach me how to live stream? So John and I spent the next days, a few days in Ferguson, and he was teaching me how to stream. We filmed protests in front of the police stations when heartbroken and angry Ferguson citizens were standing in front of the station demanding justice and answers. John taught me to put people on the camera and let them speak. He told me that the viewers of the stream were really important. You as the journalist, he said, are not that important. It's the people watching the stream who are important. He said, when you hold the, see, when you hold the camera up and you live stream, you get a chat dialogue, right? You see people chatting. You can do this in a bunch of the, the forums. And he said, I should always monitor those viewers and see the comments they're making because they'll help you out. We streamed, I remember one night, 
This is the night before Mike Brown's funeral. John and I were on this, literally at the spot where Michael Brown was killed. They had a, 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 it's a small block and they had a memorial site set up. And this one guy named John Bonds had set up a food truck there. And it was really quiet. People were just kind of contemplating everything that had happened, all the protests and all the chaos that you all saw. And we were just sitting there kind of getting ready for the funeral. And we talked to people. Um, and then the next day we attended the funeral. And I stood in line as over 5,000 people came to pay their respects. And that was kind of like my introduction to live streaming, right? But my first test was at the Black Friday mall protest in November when I came back in November after the indictment. After the indictment in November, I was in Clemson in South Carolina teaching, and I saw that they decided not to indict Darren Wilson. And my wife and I were like, oh, hell no. So we, we drove out to Ferguson again. And again, the streets had exploded. The first night got real hairy. I don't know if y'all remember, but it was very hairy. It was people were protesting. It was like, even John told me, Chinjo, I don't come out on the street. People are getting hurt out here. Strangely, the National Guard didn't intervene with that. That was an interesting thing, right? They, all this warning about violence, then when you know, the rioting actually erupted, the National Guard did nothing for a long time. Um, so people were out there screaming, and they were screaming like, you know, all kinds of some of those chants that they give out there. You know, if we don't get it, shut it down. No justice, no peace. But there was one local activist whose name I'm not going to call because these things are still going on. And he said, and by the way, that problem I'm talking about right now, where like I'm, I'm speaking about these things and writing about them and they're still going on and the people are vulnerable, that's part of the revolution reality show right there. How do you draw those lines as a scholar and as a journalist, right? Like, there's things I would love to tell you, but I can't because it's like, it's going to endanger people. But this one preacher said, I have a different idea because he said, I want to I start yelling instead of no justice, no peace, I want to talk about no justice, no profit. Because the Ferguson protesters were standing in front of those, that police station. They camped out there and was able to sustain those protests for a long time in ways that if you saw, I mean, if anybody's like, well, what's the point of this? I mean, you did, I hope you noticed that there was a Department of Justice investigation that revealed essentially that claims people have been making about the situation in Ferguson were right. Something like one third of the people there had some type of relationship to the law enforcement and the police department was funding itself by exploiting people on small, you know, petty infractions. So those protests served a purpose, don't get it twisted, right? Like things people were saying early in August that no one was listening were vindicated in those reports. Read, the, read that DOJ report if you get a chance. But as part of this, right, still in the midst of getting that going, he said, I want to talk about no justice, no profit, because the police department had become such a ritual that the police were kind of used to it now. They knew, okay, we're going to come out to the police. There's going to be people out in front of the police department. People were cooking out in front of there, right? It was really community building. You know, it was like an interesting thing. But he said, I, he, said they, he said, you know, I want to do something different. I want to shut down the malls. So his team planned to shut down a series of malls to make it clear that no shopping would go on as usual while there was no justice. Now to some of us, that might seem like an odd strategy, right? What the hell do the malls have to do really with somebody who was shot by police? But it's important to remember that boycotting and interruption has always been a part of civil rights protests, right? Always going back to sit-ins and, you know, I mean, even in Oakland, the longshoremen withheld their labor in protests over uh, Trayvon Martin, right? And what you have to remember, too, is in a capitalist economy that relies on people to constantly buy products that we don't need to forget and drown our sorrows and medicate our anger about injustice with holidays in which the only thing holy is the mighty dollar bill, they can never ignore the interruption of a shopping mall. So I charged my cell phone batteries. It was like, all right, change. I'm going to practice my live streaming. So technically, at that point, I was a protester. I kept my camera out of sight until the protest started, right? Like you're in the mall, you know something's about to jump off, right? Minding my business, and then all of a sudden someone yells, hands up, hands up, don't shoot. hands up, don't shoot. and all of a sudden, just imagine you're in the food court, somebody says hands up, and like 300 people stand up. They were like, oh man, you know what I mean? So it was crazy. And they started walking around the mall. So I grabbed my camera and I started recording. Let me give you a little snippet of what that was like. This is a little picture of those mall protests, right? Some die-ins, right? Let's take a look here. Oh yes, oh yes. 
Now, uh, I tried to capture everything that was going on, right? Very quickly, my screen starts filling up with viewers. First zero, then 25, then 80. I asked the viewers to share the stream on Twitter. I could see the numbers go up to 100, and then 200, and 300. On the stream, people started talking to each other about the protest, about the case. Friends of mine from different places saying they wish they were there. I thanked them for watching, right? Now, mind you, as you can tell here, I didn't really still know what I was doing. Mainly, I was just kind of excited. Somebody pulled the drum out, and I was more excited than the protesters. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, not sure. I'm blurring that line between, am I a scholar doing an ethnography of social movements? Am I a journalist documenting a social movement? Or am I a protester just part of the movement? I wasn't sure, right? But clearly, all those roles were informing what was going on. Also, one thing I realized in the context of those protests is that when you live stream, you play a crucial role in protecting people. There's a performative aspect to the phones, right, where the, you know, police didn't get too violent inside their shopping mall, but when they got close to protesters to try to put their hands on us, everybody would hold their phones up, whether they had live stream or not. This is where it gets real theoretical, it gets panoptic. It's like, even if, you know, the, the police officers have to assume that your phone is streaming, whether it is or not. You know, a lot of people can't afford those plans, but they just were like, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it works, right, to some extent. Or it, it works one way or the other. It works, hopefully, because people's civil rights aren't abused and human rights. But on the other side, you maybe capture those kinds of things, and, and it, there's a documentation of that violation, right? But, you know, this is also where the Revolution Reality Show becomes complicated, right? Because a couple of times when I saw police getting rough with people, do I hold this video up and show and keep showing to make sure that that is documented so that people can really see that that's really real happening because there's a lot of people out here who don't think police do bad things to people or do I intervene and stop somebody from getting beat the hell up right it's a complicated problem right I mean inhabiting always these protests looking at a screen so another thing I wanted to just throw in there is a lot of people claim that we were hurting employees by using that strategy but that's not what I saw I mean a, employ a lot of employees, you know, you saw like the black employees behind the gate, they would like throw up the little clandestine black cops, like, yeah, black, I can't, you know, I'm working, dog, but yeah, you know, I feel you. you know? <laughs> now, of course, that wasn't everybody, right? I mean, there was also some uh, white people in the mall who were like, I, I never forget, it was one of the malls where like, I was, we, were, we walked into a store and then we walked back out and there was a white woman and she was there with her daughter and her daughter was horrified, right? I mean, because, mind you, there had been riots, so the prospect of black violence, even though these, all these malls, I can attest, I mean, protests were completely peaceful, right? And everybody was crystal clear. The protesters knew that to, to maintain that moral position, they had to be peaceful, right? So they were, everybody was very peaceful, but this, this, this little girl was like so horrified, right? And I kind of understand, right? It's like angry black people. Oh. So I kind of like, I, tr I, I tried to do something that was impossible and sort of a stupid move. And I guess she walked up and was like, it's okay, we're just, no. You know, and the mother was like, seriously? And I was just like, yeah, that girl's a racist for life now. I said, it's, it's done. I just, made, I just made a racist. So anyway, but, um, speaking of race, one thing I noticed that's really important is that the protests were not divided by race. Um, as you can see in here, there were all kinds of people in there, all kinds of people of every race, identity category joined the movement, and they played key roles. I mean, I don't want to get off topic here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this one secret, even though this is a little dangerous just because it's so hilarious. The, the, there was one mall in which that we were trying to go to, and it was kind of an upscale mall. And the problem was two, twofold. One, how to get a whole lot of black people into this upscale mall, because it's now, because we shut down over the course of uh, those two days about five malls. I'm talking about the malls closed on Black Friday weekend. I was next to the person who led the protest when the police chief called him and was like, dog, you got to stop. This is really a problem now. And he was like, yeah, well, you know, y'all got to stop. So, but. This one upscale mall, as we were going into it, we were like, how can we get everybody in? Because if we get like 10 black people walk in this mall, they're going to know something's up. <laughs> then the National Guard is out there, they come and it's a wrap. <laughs> so there was like this, and then the other problem was, you hear they had a drum in there. There was like this young man who was playing this drum, right? And he would like, he would turn it up and it was like, but how do you get a drum, right? Like, much less just a regular black dude. Now a black dude with a drum, right? <laughs> and he was from Ferguson. He was kind of like from the hood. So he just, he just, you just knew he, 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 just, he didn't belong, right? It was like, so it was like, so there was like this French, you know, white woman who was like, I can bring the drum in. She's like, yes, French girl with the drum, I'm, I'm sure I can bring it in. And she was right, right? It's like, you know, a French white woman walking into a upscale mall with a drum, whatever, who knows? She, had, she's just, she just has a drum, right? Like, well, it's no big deal, right? So the plan actually was get all the white people in first in position, right? Then they kind of 
let us know where the cops are, and then like, you know, we're gonna like, then the black people come in, you know, immediately. And you see the asymmetric tactics there, right? Well, I mean, it's problematic to stop people. You know, malls are not like Trump dollars. You just can't throw people out because they're black. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have a reason. So that's what we did. So she brought the drum in, and then we kind of went in, and you know, and as soon as we did it, we didn't wait long. It was like, hands up, don't shoot. He got the drum, she passed it off. Here you go. Yeah, you know, people started going, and you know, it was it was fascinating. And so, but the and that the the the, the ability of folks to come together beyond identity. I mean, that was one of the things I saw that was different. I feel like a change in the civil rights movement. I mean, people, LGBT community, everybody was there, and it wasn't that those tensions weren't present, but people were able to see a bigger goal which I think was important to establish that form of political power. So what are some lessons from this part of the Revolutionary Reality Show? One, for you all, streaming is a great way to document events and to share the experience of the event um, with the community. It's also a great way to build an audience, right? People have to, if you use Ustream, which I use, people follow you and you can build an audience who you can share later, right? Actually, a lot of these audiences were pre-constituted for the social movement scholars from Occupy. So Occupy, there's a way in which Occupy has had a long life into Ferguson because there were already pre-constituted social media networks that got re-leveraged in the context of the Ferguson and Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but there's also some downstream, downsides to streaming. I mean, I felt like I was often less present in the, mo in the moment. It was really powerful sometimes when you're looking at every life through a screen, you just feel like, you know, there was times, and sometimes I just did crappy journalism because I was like, you know what, I'm, this isn't, everything doesn't need to be on camera. The, there was boundaries about what were the borders when I was when it was cool. I mean, pretty you know, pretty much as journalists, you know, journalists, we really like when you're doing that kind of stuff. You don't really ask people. It's like you put them on camera first, and somebody got to walk away from you. You know, but that was invasive at times. So how do you negotiate those boundaries? I mean, these are theoretical questions, and that I'm that I'm thinking through, and I want your help with that. I don't claim to have an answer. And the camera influences how people perform. There was also times I wondered. I remember in Clemson one time watching a person be pulled over by the police, and it looked like it was going fine, but they started yelling, and I pulled out the camera, and I, I definitely saw the guy start to acting up when the camera came on, because he, he was pretty much, he had done something wrong, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he was like, you know, when I put the camera up, he was like, oh, man, see what they're doing to me? See what they're doing? I was like, no. I just, no, man, I, I put the camera down. I was like, you know. <laughs> but another thing, too, is that streams are great as a historical archive, to have document, I have a great documentation of a lot of things that have happened over the past two years. But one question I've wondered with the streams and even with some of these protests is if all we have after it is just a, a document that we just, like some video where we turned up and yelled at police, how does that translate into transformative political power? We need something beyond that. So, so those are some of the problems with the Revolutionary Reality Show. But it's important to show up and document, and this is a great technology and ways to do that. All right, um, moving forward. What do we call it? When reality, <laughs> oh yeah, I did it the wrong way, yeah. All right, well, what do we call it? Great, cool, 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 all right. So y'all playing along with my little game. All right, um, hmm, let me see. Oh, one other thing I wanted to play for y'all was what I wanted to mention about this with streaming was when John first taught me to stream, he said, Chen, you know, now you can stream in your area. And this was early 2014, I said, or late to middle 2014, I said, John, I live in South Carolina. There's nothing going on in South Carolina to stream. It's not like Ferguson. Uh, I was wrong. A lot has happened in South Carolina in the past two years. Um, this is my wife, by the way. She's also an incredible streamer, and everything I would do wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for her. Incredible. She teaches women's leadership, and it's important we're talking, and I want to make sure I'm clear about that with all these social movements, that who you put on camera is important because women tend to be written out of these struggles, and their role is absolutely central, women's leadership. Particularly with Ferguson and Black Lives Matter, I mean, these are things started by black queer women, and they risked being written out of the narrative. The same thing happened in Missouri with the Missouri protests, with the football, you know, and all that. The Concern 1950 was started by black women, really. But because Jonathan uh, went on the fast, he started to take over the narrative. So men and people documenting, we need to make, that's a problem we have to be particularly attentive to, is to not make those narratives in that way. But here's some of the footage that happened as a result of that, right? You got CNN. Um, 
this is, I think, uh, Time or Newsweek, right? And then after that, here's some things that happen in South Carolina where nothing happens. I just, I'm just giving you some snippets. Oh, this is nothing but just a KKK rally at the State House. <laughs> That's all. So you're going to have to stay on this side. Yeah, no. That would be the KKK. That would be the police making sure the land is the market. I got one. We got you for the land. was in front of the Emanuel AME Church after the murders there. And this was just a moment that was like, I just found really compelling with people out there praying and protesting. But if I want to show y'all something, I want you to see the nine rivers that they put up for the nine victims. I'm not a very religious person, but... <laughs> People just trying to hear the best they can. <laughs> Moving on. When I heard GOP presidential candidate Donald Trump was coming to Clemson University where I teach, I didn't initially plan to protest. But my intentions changed when someone brought it to my attention that this was happening on the anniversary of the February 10th murder of three Muslim students in a Chapel Hill, North Carolina parking lot. I remember huddling together on a cold winter evening shortly after that as members of the diverse Muslim community here at, Cle at, there at Clemson came together for a vigil. Then a few days before the rally, I got a Facebook message from a former student of mine, Sheffy Carminick. She asked me if anyone was willing to protest or if they just were going to let that happen. She seemed disheartened when I explained that Clemson had the right to bring any presidential candidate, no matter how controversial. I grew up with my family and dad being targeted because he wears a turban as Sikh. And since I work with university students, it triggered me knowing he was talking at Clemson, she replied. I just can't accept the idea of him spreading his rhetoric of fear and his delusional methodology for making America great to the next generation. Reading her words and thinking about some of the students on my campus, we have a huge Latino population or in, in South Carolina, although not as many of them at Clemson as they should be. You all do a much better job of that here. Um, I was like, you know, as a professor who's safe in a lot of ways, I, I should probably do something. But I wasn't sure what to do. Because Trump has become very good at using the protests to sort of strengthen his campaign. And I just didn't want to do the typical thing. So I was, in, and really Trump, I mean, just to do a little, now, you know, Trump has been great about using the logic of our systems against itself, right? I mean, in some ways, he's been able to draw on GOP populist rhetoric that has been around for a long time, right? The things he's saying are not different than things that Newt Gingrich and all the other people have been saying. But now he's able to redeploy those things while also critiquing the GOP establishment. It's really ingenious because a lot of things he's saying about the GOP establishment are right. It's not that Trump, everybody talks about Trump is lying. The things he's saying about Martin, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and their, uh, you know, the fact that these people are uh, you know, indebted to corporate interests and stuff like that, and even when he says that about Hillary Clinton, he's not wrong. People know that. So you know, they say that every lie is 80% truth, right? So he's using that system against himself and the logic of our media because post Citizens United, we have tremendous incentives for political coverage. And Trump understands that these ratings dominate everything, and they just take everything to the lowest common denominator. So
So he's able to use that logic to create more stories about himself, driving polls, right? So it's about using the logic of the system against itself. And that's what I said. How can I use the logic of his rhetoric against itself? Earlier this year, I had seen a Muslim activist Rose Hamid with her protest, where she went dressed in how she dresses in her hijab and was peaceful and was kicked out. And I made contact with Rose, actually, after this. And so I liked what she did. I thought it was effective in, in showing certain things about the effect of that rhetoric. But I wanted to do something a little different. So I decided I'm going to go to a Trump rally, right? And I'm going to wear West African clothing, which is what I sometimes wear, you know, depending on where you see me. But I also decided I'm going to wear a kefir because I asked a Muslim friend of mine who's, uh, you know, Arabian, I mean, uh, Arab, I said, you know, would you... Uh, be willing to, you think this is a good idea, I don't want to do something offensive, and she was like, please do this. I'll wrap the kefir for you. So she wrapped it for me, and uh, that's how I decided to go. Um, and so, you know, oh, sorry. I got into the rally, and basically, the rally was held at a facility that's normally reserved for livestock events, such as rodeos, horse shows, and cattle auctions. And it was packed with nearly 5,000 seats. I mean, completely packed. When I saw that rally, I was like, Trump got South Carolina on lock. A sea of red Make America Great Again hats and bomb the hell out of ISIS t-shirts. I saw one brother selling the t-shirts. And he kind of realized what I was doing as I walked up in this outfit. Right? He was like, he's like, turn up in there, dog. And I was like, yeah, I'm just like, get that money, player. I understand. You know, he was <laughs> 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 Um, the smell of popcorn and stale manure hung in the air as Trump's voice echoed throughout the arena. He had started when we got there. When I walked up to the security check, it was deep, right? The officer kind of froze. I had the full outfit on, and I kind of smiled. I said, I, took my, I was with my, my uh, fellow grad student, my, he's a grad student, A.D. Carson. I said, A.D., start recording. This might be it. <laughs> Raised my hands up, put my keys on the, on the belt. I looked at the officer, I smiled, I was like, you know, I, I was, I was, yeah, and believe it or not, it was a feeling of love. I was like, fam, I realize the situation you're in, brother, but come on now, <laughs> you know? Let's get a victory for human rights, let a brother in, <laughs> you know? And then he's like, he did, he looked at me, he hesitated, and then he blessed me with the wand, and I, and I was in, <laughs> in that outfit. So I was like, all right, I want to get as close to the, to the action as I can. So I, there was an elevated area, so I walked down to the area in the outfit, and I kind of stood there for a minute, I really stood there because I wasn't 100% sure really what to do because I didn't think I was going to get in. So I stood there and I kind of just looked at Trump and when I saw him, I just was kind of, I, I was kind of gritting on Trump, I'm not going to lie to you. I wasn't worried about the people next to me. And I had this incredible feeling of everything I was doing because I had that outfit on. I wasn't, I was, uh, there was 5,000 people, there was probably three or 400 people standing, right? But I felt like me standing was wrong. I felt it, the weight of those gazes on my body. And, I was, and it was cold outside, so I had taken my coat off. So all of a sudden, I was like, wait a minute, my hands aren't showing. Let me put my coat down. So I put the coat down. Then I was like, wait a minute. They might think something under the coat. <laughs> then I was like, all right, well, let me sit down. Then I sat down, and two security guards came behind me, right? And so, you know, and then like a guy came and sat next to me and to make sure I was between he and his family. One guy was real important. One guy kind of peeped, peeped what the game was, and he walked over and said, hello, friend. And I was like, hello, brother, how you doing, you know? But that wasn't the dominant sentiment. So when the speech was, when the speech was done, he welcomed people to come up and sign autographs. And I was like, I would like to get an autograph, you know? <laughs> so I started walking towards the stage. An officer grabbed my arm, and I was told I had to leave. And I asked, I said, well, wait a minute, why do I have to leave? There's hundreds of people at the stage. And they were like, we have the right to make you live. I said, no, Dad, you have the right. And mind you, let me say this, too. When they grabbed my arm, my first instinct was to like stiffen up, but I suddenly realized, like, Chenge, relax, brother. How many more steps in this story do we need before you wind up getting shot justifiably, before the officer feared for his life? So no matter how I felt about this dude grabbing me, I had to immediately calm down, relax, and I, you know, raised my hands up. And I was like, I understand, and I just started asking him questions. Then I remember to put my camera out, like, oh shit, you know. And, I, and I, that was that was tricky, but I was like, I gotta do it. I was like, change. As I did it, I literally thought, change. You literally might get a bullet in your ass right now. But I was like, you know, <laughs> see, give me camera. <laughs> so why are you kicking me out, right? And they never really answered. And then they asked AD, my friend who was with me, to leave, and he didn't. He had on, you know, just kind of dressed how you all are dressed. You know what I mean? So we got outside, and I kept asking, why? Why was I made to leave? And eventually, a police officer who didn't like 
I think he felt bad about it, actually, the sheriff. And he said, listen, the Trump people told us that you are no longer welcome here. So at that point, I said, OK. Hey, D, I hope you caught that on camera, brother. And we went home. And it was really sad. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about it in a light way, but when I went back and I thanked the woman who had wrapped the kefir, it was an emotional moment. She almost, like, I said, man, I said, that was deep. I said, I, I thought I understand, you know, you're a professor who teaches about these things, but until you're in that moment, feeling the weight of those gazes on your body, you don't get it. And she looked at me almost with anger. She was like, can you imagine how I, how I feel? And so I went home and I was like, I got to put this up and make a video. So I made a video, which I'll play for you. Some of you may have seen it. so focused on stomping out threats to American safety. 
and freedom. In light of that, we should be clear about something. From a statistical perspective, there is simply no evidence that Islamic terror or immigration are primary or even significant threats facing U.S. citizens. Consider other more immediate threats to human life. The National Safety Council places the lifetime odds of dying from cancer or heart disease at 1 in 7, dying from chronic lower respiratory disease at 1 in 28, and dying in a motor vehicle crash at 1 in 112. To me, those statistics are legitimately panic. Like, if y'all want to freaking run out the door right now, you can. That's, that's, that's scary. But on the other hand, Richard Barrett, former coordinator of the United Nations Al-Qaeda and Taliban monitoring team, estimates the odds of dying of a terrorist attack in the U.S. between 2007 and 2011 at 1 in 20 million. Despite these numbers, New Hampshire primary polls uh, indicate that 66% of Republicans support Trump's ban on Muslims. In South Carolina, exit polls showed 75% of GOP voters support that. And indeed, many people saying that's why they're voting for him. What are the lessons here? <clears throat> um, oh, okay, I didn't play. Maybe in the Q&A, somebody asked me about the talk radio. I'm going to skip it. There's a talk radio thing that happened as well. Some of my friends claim that friends of theirs who supported Donald Trump changed their minds as a result of this video. But I kind of don't think that that was mostly the effect, right? I think actually my video probably put people who are in the Trump camp more firmly in their positions, right? And, you know, a, a video like this, you really have to think about what is the impact of it. I mean, one important thing I did, I tried to get a conversation started. One theme I want to bring across to you all is when you're using these kind of media things and doing activism, it's really important to write. In the end, with all the technology and everything, writing, your ability to make a nuanced argument about things, and it, it lasts longer, and I just find it even has more social media impact. By the way, earlier two hours ago, I just, a piece, I just posted a piece on Vice Media, so I encourage you all to check that out and share if you think it's worthwhile. And that, I think, actually may have more impact in the video, the, that written piece. But one thing I just want to point out is that, as I said before, Trump's rhetoric didn't come out of anywhere. Uh, the basic themes of his message have a long life in GOP rhetoric, and for a long time, people who are against that kind of thing just laugh. We like to laugh at it, right? Because really, in the end of the day, one of the ways that we deal with racism is we just like to add, pretend that only poor, underprivileged people, white people in South Carolina are the people with race problems, right? It's really like a class thing where we get, we get, they get to be the ones who are racist, right? It's some, only some drunk person staggering out of Applebee's that's racist. <laughs> Nobody else, right? Pretty good job. <laughs> so, um, but I think that, you know, the, what are the implications of laughing at that kind of thing instead of, instead of organizing against it? But one thing I also want to say is that I remember when I first was talking about the Trump rally on Facebook, someone said, they have a legal right to do this. There's nothing we can do. I just want to point out there's always something you could do. All right. Y'all ready for some more of the Revolutionary Reality Show? Yeah. All right. I'm going to wrap up here, my last little piece. And then we can get into a Q&A. <clears throat> um, why don't we, should we start out? No, we won't start out there. <laughs> um, I love public radio. And in a way, you have permission to forget about all the other stuff I just talked about and think of this talk as being about public radio and public media because it's really important form and really entertaining. I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older, but some of the inc most incredible stories and important journalism. You want to do an experiment? One day in the morning, turn on CNN, right? And watch CNN for about 15 minutes. And then listen to NPR for about 10 minutes and just compare the absurdity of CNN's coverage in comparison to what you get from public radio still. Not that public radio is perfect, right? And one of the things I, that I really love about public media is storytelling. It's the way we can tell stories, right? And so I really wanted to learn how to tell stories. And the truth is, I've told stories to people for most of my life. I tell them to my friends, strangers, students, colleagues, political allies, romantic partners, my wife. And that's really too bad because for most of my life, I've been a horrible storyteller. You know, like, I'm just really horrible at telling stories. You know anybody who's like a horrible storyteller? They just go on and on rambling pointless stories, or they focus on de bad details, and they don't get to any satisfactory ending, where you just feel like, even if you didn't have anything planned, you're like, damn, like, I just lost five minutes of my life. <laughs> that was me. Um, it still is me when I don't prepare. So I went to, I took a workshop um, with an organization called Transom. That, that I encourage you all to explore. Uh, they really, they help prepare radio producers and 
I mean, the truth is, is that when I see what you all have here, in a way, you all don't need transom because you have the resources here. I hope some of you all are using it. Tremendous. I'm not going to do the old fogey thing like, you kids don't get it. You don't understand the resources you have. Because I know the struggle is real and it's a time thing. But you really do have a wealth of things to draw on here. And I hope you really do because it's, 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 it's public media is for everybody. So I took this workshop. And I'm going to try to expedite this, the telling of this story. But basically, um, what happened was I, we, we had to profile a community member. So I had to profile a fisherman. And at the end, we had to actually play our piece for the community member. So I had to come up with questions. I had to come up with kind of a story structure. And then eventually, I had to narrate it. But when I went to narrate the story, everybody I had been listening to was like, I would glass. Anybody listen to This America Life? You know, raise your hand a couple of, oof, OK, good. That's a little bit, better. OK, couple. Right. And then there's other, like, Invisibilia. There's, like, Serial. Anybody heard Serial? What'd you say? Snap Judgment. Snap Judgment. But I hadn't really listened to Snap Judgment enough. I, had, I was listening to Serial, Roman Mars. And so in that particular form of narrative nonfiction journalism, it, it, the voices sound very white, whatever that means. We can walk into those problems in the Q&A. So, and I, so I just was like, dang, should I, am I, I talk like this? Because I, I haven't heard a host who sounds like the way I sound, right? And so I eventually made it through that. And just to give you, I want to give you a snippet of that. So let me pull out of here for a minute, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. I'm a hip hop artist like every black male between the ages of uh, three and 40. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to give you an example of what I sound like as a hip hop artist. <clears throat> being on some slave ish with massive field of pressure this change quick they be on that shooting take a man life quick choke hold grand jury no indictment oh lord no the devil is a lie corrupt prosecutors see the devil in your eyes some good cops some devils in disguise now we changing up the system so the devils can't hide boy we can shut your city down real quick real quick, quick. real sh uh. politicians about to feel this we can shut your city down real quick real quick, real quick. Real this whole world about to feel this. Uh, too many names make my heart hurt. Brutality on my nation like a dark curse. I can't breathe, hear my brother dying. Every day another name, another mother crying. Oh Lord, now we shutting down your Walmart. No justice, no profit at your ballpark. Uh, I guess they thought we wouldn't fight back. Tear gas, rubber bullets, but we right back. Now they wanna blame us for the violence, but peaceful protests ain't create this environment. All right, so that's me as a rapper. Now here's me trying to, thank you. Here's me <laughs> trying to pretend to sound like a reporter. Also, I can't help but take, I want you to, I want you to take note of the gorgeous voice of the person I'm interviewing. When he comes in, he just has a wonderful, beautiful voice. And it may have been, he can't shake the moment he lost a 50 pound white sea bass. Well, of course, you know, the ones that got away stay with you for a long time it was before sunrise and he was alone you don't have any help you don't have a, an extra guy to put the gaff in the fish you've got to kind of do it all yourself which is the ultimate challenge and then the moment every fisherman waits for yeah i had a nice fish a nice white sea bass <laughs> it may have been one of the biggest sea bass so you get the idea it was a little bit of a little bit of a different flavor <laughs> Man, also I, use this. I only have one score I use for everything, so I don't know if you notice. It's the same score from the Trump video. Um, so I made it through that, and I, but I talked about this problem of the lack of diversity of voices, right? And Rob Rosenthal and Jay Allison, who are legends, and Samantha Brown, who was, who, was, who was key in helping me edit this piece, said, you should write something about that. And so I wrote a piece about it. And um, uh, let me get back into this. Um, and, you know, once again, I mean, this was actually before, the, but it, the piece was very successful. I mean, you know, I started seeing all my favorite public radio people tweeting it, and eventually BuzzFeed did a version of it. The piece also went uh, kind of like viral, really, on BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed is a beast, by the way. Y'all should write for BuzzFeed because, whew, I'm worried about BuzzFeed, by the way, for that reason. But in terms of promotion, it's like unequaled in terms of how they figured out the science of what make things, making things go viral. And then I did a piece for NPR, and All Things Considered, and All Things Considered was coming through, uh, you know, everybody's car who was listening to it across the United States. So that was exciting. I mean, it was, can you imagine? That was exciting to sit in my car and listen to All Things Considered, and then I get to hear my own voice. But the, the bigger point had been just me sort of with my ego thing was more like, 
the diversity, realizing like how you don't get to hear a lot of voices like that. And there's really important implications for that. And so I encourage you to check out that piece. It's called Vocal Color for Public Radio. One other thing I want to point out, this little, tri little side note, the piece was in some ways talking about the whiteness of public radio. And initially, oh, this is live streaming, huh? Well, it doesn't matter. So um, basically, I, uh, uh, Okay, so we called it, we decided to call it vocal color in public radio. And I like that because color is kind of like, it could mean a lot of things. It's not only about you know, ethnicity, it could also be about just how you speak. But one of the things that BuzzFeed did was they were like, okay, not vocal color, we're going to call this challenge, oh no, we're going to call it the whiteness of public radio. So that's what BuzzFeed called it. They ramped it up. Now, people that know me think that was my choice. They're like, yeah, there's Ginger Eye, see how he is? Divisive. The whiteness of public radio. I'm like, no, that was BuzzFeed. It wasn't me. You know what I mean? And then NPR, who I would think of as like the sort of most tame, they made it challenging the whiteness of public radio. So none of those choices were mine. It's an interesting thing. But they, they kind of, they knew what they had to do to make that clickbait. You know what I mean? Um, now, I got a lot of, clearly a lot of responses. I mean, I think, and I say this humbly, but it's safe to say that this kind of really ignited a whole new conversation about public media. I mean, we got public media the trend on Twitter. Not like the new Rihanna song, you know what I mean? <laughs> work, work, work. It wasn't that day. It was public media, you know. <laughs> all right. Now, all the responses, of course, weren't positive. Um. Hi. Yes. If you can just pass this message along to Dr. Jones, uh, I'm calling. I'm concerned about an associate professor, I believe, with the last name of Kumanika who is tweeting some stuff that is, is quite frankly ridiculous, and, and number two, he's teaching students uh, just some bad stuff. Um, <clears throat> he's right now saying that he's basically criticizing individuals for enunciating on national public radio or public radio in general. He's upset because he doesn't like the fact that people are made to change the way that they speak, and I'm assuming by based off the way he's talking it about it, individuals of African-American descent who sound African-American in particular. Well, as an individual who has worked in broadcasting their whole entire career, um, yeah, well, guess what? You can't sound too Southern, and you can't sound too Indian, and you need to be able to enunciate that way people from all walks of life can understand what you're saying. Oh. He's making everything into a racial matter, and you guys are allowing this to continue. Dr. Jones, I don't know what you think is going to transpire with all of this and what he's whipping up with students, but I'm sorry. If you sound uneducated, you shouldn't be on the radio. If you sound like you cannot speak English when you're on an English platform, okay, you shouldn't be on national public radio. People of all walks of life have to be able to understand you. And I have sounded too Southern to some people in broadcasting. I've sounded too northern to some people in broadcasting. I've been too white, and I've not been white enough. I've been not black for jobs. I've been non-Hispanic for jobs. I've been a lot of things throughout my career. It's ridiculous. I cannot believe he's teaching your students this. And the one thing I would like to get across to you, if you guys don't realize this, he's going to set them up for failure. Okay, because broadcasting in general is a tough job. And yeah, you're right. Guess what? News directors, uh, station managers, they have an idea of what they want before they hire it. And that's how they do it. So if you guys continue this on, you will fail to have successful broadcasters. You will, have, you will fail to have successful communicators. So I hope you pay attention. I hope you see what he's doing. This man is ruining your communications department. Thank you very much. Okay. Um. Uh, we're running short on time, so I'm going to edit my comments a little bit. But one thing I want to say is that, you know, um, one, th one thing I learned from this, aside from things like that, was that, you know, when you have a piece that is very influential, I mean, I had the, the uh, ombudsman of the um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting call me and ask if he could cite my piece in his ethics statement, Bill Samiring, who kind of, um, you know, revamped and was one of the founders of NPR you know, emailed me several times. You started getting invited to, you know, I got a lot of Twitter followers and Facebook, right? I became like a person and all of a sudden you're invited to comment on everything. You start feeding into the social media thirst, right? Like I got to tweet on everything, you know, Facebook, right? And I did do a little bit of that. I did a lot of interviews. 
But in the end, the things that proved to be the most impactful were the written things that I did, the developed written pieces and the developed written radio pieces. And that's what I want to say to you all, is that don't let that social media thirst stop you from producing things. I mean, I'm just telling you, in terms of, even in terms of the impact, right? Like, I can kick out a tweet or a Snapchat story or whatever like that, but, like, this Vice piece even is going to wind up getting me more um, conversation than that, even if you just want to, like, attract followers. But more importantly, in terms of doing things that are a lasting contribution to the conversation, I can't stress enough the importance of writing. All right? And I say that as somebody who never really saw myself as a writing. Writing includes audio documentary and just other forms of developed things. And by the way, there's also a business angle to this. You know, um, Gimlet Media, Chris Neary works with Gimlet Media, is doing some really cool podcasts. Um, they, he basically has made, just wrote a piece in Forbes about long form media. That's the way to connect with millennials. There's a lot of evidence. People want serial. We just want good stories, right? I mean, even in television, right? We want the better, these long, addictive things, right? So keep that in mind and make that a part of what you make. To wrap up, this is the part where I'm gonna get on my little social justice soapbox for a minute. Um, we need to reclaim storytelling, folks. There are social justice stories that need to be told, and a lot of people think that the only people who, who have stories to tell are brands, you know, and uh, silly political figures. But we need stories that are going to help us imagine a different kind of world. And I, and I want you all to help us imagine that different kind of world with the stories that you make. Everybody in here can make media and tell stories. These are some of the ways you can do it, but there's many others. And to give you some examples, if you're having trouble thinking, I'm going to share with you a couple of ideas. We need stories that can help us to imagine a, a, a world in which we don't have these infinite wars. To quote Chris Hedges, the folly of endless war is one of the signs of a dying civilization. One F-22 Raptor fighter plane costs $350 million. We have 187 of them. One Tomahawk cruise missile costs $1.41 million. We fired 161 of them when we attacked Libya. This missile attack on Libya alone cost us a quarter of a billion dollars. We spent an estimated 1.7 trillion a year on war, far more than the official 54% of discretionary spending, or roughly 600 billion. If we don't break the back of that war machine, profound change would be impossible. Now, it's easy for me to make a statement like that and important, but you all have to tell the stories that bring the consequences of this war machine, right? Or home and abroad to life, put flesh on those bones. It's important for me to say we have to declare global warming a national and global emergency, devote our energy resources to saving the planet through public investment in renewable energy, and, and end our reliance on fossil fuels. But you all have to be the ones to tell stories in creative ways to help people understand the impact of climate change and the, and the potential of new solutions. It's important for me to say we should have universal single health, single payer health care and a banning of the for-profit uh, corpor health care corporations. But you all have to talk about what it actually is like when you don't have health care. We don't hear that story enough, right, to make that real for people. And I can't imagine all the ways that you can imagine that. What is it like in your lives? It's important for me to say that we need to have grant full citizenship to undocumented workers, right? But why isn't somebody talking about the fact that in Denver, Denver has the longest waiting period for immigration cases than any place in the country? 933 days and there's 9,420 cases pending. We need to talk about that. There's a, a museum exhibit down at Mu Museo de las Americas right now about the experience of immigration. Somebody needs to tell that story. We can talk about full equality for our, our LGBT community, but who's telling those stories to really make us imagine those, right? Like, think of the stories that we do consume and the stories we don't. It's important for us to talk about a woman's right to control her own body. But again, we need to bring that to life for a patriarchal society that can't imagine another way. Right to, to help men and help other people imagine a, a different wor world and different policies. Because if we're serious, it's not really, it's a lack of imagination, I think, is part of the problem, right? And w by the way, we need to talk about the way that Black Lives Matter leaders are coming together with the reproduct reproductive justice movement. Alicia Garza and uh, the sister Natasha, um, Natasha Mays just came together. Black Lives Matter with reproductive justice. But I, I want to hear a story about that. Someone needs to tell it. We need to talk about prohibiting all forms of male violence against women. In South Carolina, where I'm at, we have the number one rate of uh, women killed by their domestic partners every year. Not enough, as far as I'm concerned, until that ends, there's not enough story. That's the only story we should be telling. Um, we, could, we, we need to talk about supporting two years of paid maternity leave, shorter work weeks with no loss of pay and benefits, providing a weekly income of $600 to unemployed and disabled, right? 
We need to talk about free education from daycare to the university, forgive all student debt, right? But again, who's talking about the debt strike movement where the Corinthian students were defrauded and they fought back and got them to eliminate that debt, right? Who's talking about that? We need to talk about ending mass incarceration. And woof, in South Carolina, I don't know what it's like in Colorado, but in South Carolina, there are some stories to be told about that criminal justice system that are even deeper than the ones that we've seen. But it's going to take you all to go and tell those kinds of stories, right, in whatever ways you can. I found that kind of work to be deeply fulfilling. It's kind of like being paid to listen to people who haven't been heard. And, you know, at the current moment when I talk about the Revolution Reality Show, what's really revolutionary, sadly, is the way that our environment, our economy, and our personal lives are being transformed in ways that intensify injustice, inequality, and alienation. But by adding your stories and your activism, you can transform it into something more than a show. It can become an actual collective revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kumanyika. Uh, we now have time for uh, questions and uh, some Q&A. I'd like to uh, ask you to keep your questions short so we can engage as many as possible. Um, we'll be passing around the microphone uh, in order to ask some of these questions, and uh, I'll do my best to move around the room. I'm going to pass the mic all the way to the back uh, corner, the gentleman in the back corner there. So if you'll please send that in that direction. Oh, it's real simple. Where can we find your information? Right, yeah, that's a, <laughs> uh, that's a good, um, hmm, let me see, uh, you could go here, chingerai.net, and uh, just write that down, and then you, my Twitter is on there too, and all that kind of thing, so you can send me an email there. Thank you. And please do stay in contact. I mean, I, I like to try to stay in contact with everybody. It might take me a minute to get with you, but I want to know the stories. And we all retweeting each other. We can change the landscape. You know what I'm saying? Hi. Um, my name's Jared. Um, Jared. Uh, you had mentioned one of your students had contacted you about something that had triggered her. Um, and I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on um, those concerns on both like the left and right sides about microaggressions and how they might be stunting um, the ability for students to be able to deal with uh, conflicting ideas or uh, things of that nature. So I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's a really smart question. It's a really, it's a thing we're dealing with, you know. Um, I think... The, you know, you, I, I mean, I think everybody may be familiar. There's a thing called microaggressions, and people feel triggered, and some people have requested safe spaces, the ability to be able to leave even classes if things like sexual assault and things are broken that trigger them in certain ways. I kind of lean on the side that we have to look at where those concerns initially came from, and that there really is a threat, you know, to someone. I don't know what it's like to be raped and sexually assaulted, and so. You know the way that that affects someone. I, I don't want to. I'm not going to just be the person to say toughen up, right? So the arguments that are operating in that vein, like just toughen up, I think those are kind of silly. Um, the real concern, though, is that there are people who simply don't want to hear things that they disagree with, right? And and the, that rhetoric of safe spaces can be co-opted, right? Just like the rhetoric of hate speech can be co-opted, and often works in the opposite way. And that is a real difficulty, right? So. I guess I don't really have the answer, but I, I, I'm, I'm not prepared. I don't like the toughen up approach. I know Todd Gitlin, who's a scholar, a media scholar I respect a lot, kind of was like people have to toughen up. And you know, when I'm working with young activists, one of the things I try to focus their attention on is, and I say I love the way that people are talking about what language does and doing that, and I support you in doing that, and we have to talk about that. I'm not into this thing where like it's really hard. Like sometimes I have to. I'm, I'm still learning this stuff, right? Like sometimes I'll use the wrong term. I call somebody crazy. People are like, oh, that's ableist. I'm like, okay, no doubt, ableist. Sorry, you know, I acknowledge. I'm I, okay. I don't have. Well, I can not use that term, right? However, I also do try to talk to the young people and say, let's try to focus our energy around transformative political demands, you know. And I think some of those things do have to get beyond language. Um, so I think it's a really smart question that we need to explore more. Um, yeah, so my name is Jesse. Uh, I was just curious, in, in terms of controlling the narrative and influencing the movement, do you find that you have more or less power 
when you stream versus um, spending maybe more time or, or more energy into like a full documentary or even a short film documentary? Do you know which of those you feel like you have more power? Yeah. Um, I, well, my, my short answer is I would go with the full documentary. Yeah. That's a lot more work. But one thing I would, but, but another answer, another way of answering it is to say do both. Like one thing I regret that I haven't done more with my streaming is I think what would, would make my streaming more powerful is if you stream and then make things out of the streaming. So hopefully a message that came across in what I'm doing is you all should put yourself in interesting situations when you see things happening. And you should document those situations. And then you should make things about it. You know, and um, if you look at my streams, because I'm a busy person, there's streams up there where it's like I never edited and got to it. So I do think that streams and a lot of these other utterances, you know, to go theoretical, you know, there's a scholar whose name is Jody Dean, and she talks about communicative capitalism. And she says we have a proliferation of these utterances, right, that actually don't exert political power, right? Because, like, the, the people who are making policies don't have to listen. It doesn't matter how many times I tweet. People can ignore that. So tweeting and, and Facebook work is very satisfying, right? Like, sometimes I get a Facebook post, I'm like, yeah! <laughs> yeah! Look at those likes! But what really does that mean in terms of political power, right? So I don't want to discount it, but I would lean more towards the longer form developed works. Great, another great, yeah, that's an awesome questions. Thank you. Hi, so um, you're talking about telling stories. So people are going to hear what they want to hear. And people who are open to the story and to the message are going to seek it out. And those who are opposed to it are going to find whatever you know, reason they want to to oppose it. So then how do we turn these stories into positive action and to get more people to come along with the story? Absolutely right. Um, a again, a wonderful question, and that it really is a problem. Like I said, even with the Trump rally, right? Um, you know, I would g I'm going to give you two answers. One, we need more, st a lot of people suffer from a lack of demoralization. One thing about this in political environment, I'm very worried about the current political environment for a lot of reasons, um, but one reason is because it demoralizes people. And people are actually believe, you know, like you know, Slavoj Žižek said, look at our movies, right? We can imagine a meteorite coming to Earth and destroying everything, but we can't imagine the end of capitalism, you know? <laughs> like, so we need examples where people are pushing. Like, we need examples to talk more about, like, we need to talk about the, 15, the, the, the Fight for 15 movement. I dig it that we have problems with the unions that are behind that movement, but I'm sorry, that's real. And to me, that's a black issue. I don't care what Tiny Heath Coates says. The $15 minimum wage is a black issue because there's a lot of black fast food workers, right? So my whole thing is like, you know, that's a victory to me, right, that we have to talk about. So one thing is tell stories about victories, right? Because people see victories, they feel like they can do things. And, you know, on the left, you know, I'm not trying to say where you are, but I'm talking about the left, you know. But, like, with the left, I think people... It's almost sometimes like people on the left, we don't talk about victories enough because we're so analyzing what's wrong and how things that appear to be a victory is not a real victory. So I think we need more stories of concrete things people are doing, like those movements. Um, and the second way is to tell stories that bring people together. Well, I'm not, clearly I'm working with Black Lives Matter. I'm very, I think the politics of identity are important and can't be ignored. But I also have seen how those things can divide people from building a really transformative multi-identity movement. That's ultimately what you need. I think it can't be one identity. So I did a story for NPR about Zachary Hammond, who was a, a white teenager who was killed in the way that a lot of black teenagers are killed. And, I, and the police ran up on him. They weren't even targeting him. They were targeting the person in the car because they thought he was about to, the, the young lady in the car was going to make a, wee, a marijuana deal, right? And he ran up and just shot into the car and killed him. You should look at the, if those of you who haven't seen it, check out the video and you, you'll see. So I'm close with his family. So I wrote an article for NPR, but I tried to occupy this nuanced space where I said, you know, listen, um, there was a message in there for the, the conservative community in which Zachary Hammond lives, which is one of your children has been killed by police. And I understand your values, but you, you all need to uh, attend to this. And you need to understand that in the black community, because one of the things the Zachary Hammond family said to me when that happened, they said, if he was, he's white, you think we haven't got more of an outrage because he was, he was, he was you know, uh, because he wasn't black? And I said, no, no. The person who told me about the Zachary Hammond was a Black Lives Matter activist. But then the next day, your lawyer said Black Lives Matter activists didn't care about Zachary Hammond. 
See, so then people say, well, we got our own problems. So what I said was, you know, I wanted them to hear that message. I said, you know, this is the thing. When black people get killed by the police, we, there's a movement that goes because black people never expect to get justice from the system. So we understand that we got to mobilize, right? It's not like this happens and out of the blue Al Sharpton shows up. There's a lot of work that goes in, and we still don't know about most of the cases. There's an app. Uh, which I don't—I forget the name of it, but I'll, I'll say if you send me, it just catalogs all the people being killed by police violence. We still don't know most of those names. Accounted, is that what it's called? Well, the Accounted is the Guardian. Yeah, that's another good way. So that was one side, but I was also trying to push against the Black Lives Matter activists too. Not against them, but to say, listen, black and brown people are disproportionately killed by police. The data is there. You can go look at it. However, this young man was killed and he was white. So there's a bigger problem here that gets beyond race and gets into the war on drugs, gets into the militarization of the police. And so we can't let our focus on that disproportionate black violence stop us from organizing with other violence people. After Zachary Hammond, after I wrote that piece, another guy who was killed, Troy Good, a white guy in Mississippi, who because he's in conservative area of Mississippi, he was killed. He was, he was high, I think, at a concert, and the police came and hogtied him, and he died. And the coroner said, he didn't die because he was high. He died because he got hogtied face down on the ground. And Troy Good said, listen, since you're writing you know, uh, about this, can you help me? And I was like, I'll try. I can't be the spokesman for all white people get killed by police. But you know, so what I'm trying to do is write and tell stories that, b that bridge those divides. And I think that's, that's part of what you can do. And by the way, I'm not writing and aiming my activism at convincing the people who are most in opposition. Because to be honest, this may sound controversial, but I don't think we need them. You actually, we don't need everybody on the same page. The civil rights movement, a lot of the social change has not, wasn't, it wasn't everybody was on the same page. Most, it was kind of like now. There was a lot of people involved and most people weren't. So there's a myth that we have to get everybody in the country, all 318 million people got to be on the same page before we can do anything. But you need to go listen to Martin Luther King's speeches. He didn't say that. He said we need to change policies. And that just requires a critical sort of multi-diverse mass. So great question. I uh, want to, to ask you to uh, thank Dr. Kuminika with me uh, one more time. <laughs> We, uh, we may have some time, uh, if you have uh, just a couple more moments to speak with uh, Dr. Kuminika, ask a few more questions. I know uh, some of us have to proceed to uh, other classes or to other obligations, so I want to make sure that we have uh, some room for the people who need to exit here in the next couple minutes to exit. But uh, if you want to hang tight for just a moment, we can uh, maybe ask just a few more questions. Yeah, cool. Is that okay, man? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Oh, thank you, man. All right, what's your name, man? Arthur. Parker, pleasure to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. All right, respect. I don't, I don't, but I'll give you my, I'll give you my, 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 my.